Welcome everyone to episode one in an unmissable webinar series presented by Ship It, in which we'll explore the top retailer questions, concerns and hot topics throughout the months of February with a revolving panel of retail leaders. Today's session is Navigating the Storm, Consumer Confidence and Cost Pressures Unveiled. We have got a bit of a storm here. We are having some issues with our cameras, so we're going to be having an audio only session. I've got with me on my panel, Rob Hangozada from Ship It and Jeff Marks from the Nile Group. My name's Rosalie, I am the editor at Power Retail and I'll be the interviewer and moderator today. I'll get you two to introduce yourselves and your roles in a second. Just before we kick off some housekeeping to our viewers here today, we have a Q&A section at the end, time allowing. So please pop any of your questions into the chat as they come up and I will address them with our panel at the end. So let's get underway. Rob, would you like to quickly introduce yourself and your role? Absolutely. G'day, everybody. My name is Rob Hangozada. I am the joint CEO and co-founder of ShipIt. Uh, ShipIt was established about nine years ago in the Australian market, and uh, we've seen some tremendous growth in online retail over that last almost decade. Um, it's a very different universe we find ourselves in today versus when we started the business. But Ship it has always been predicated on one thing, and that is, uh, you know, helping our customers make and meet the delivery promises they make to their customers. Um, so my job here at Ship it is to obviously run the business. I co-founded it alongside William On. Uh, Will has headed over to Asia to set up the business across the region there, and is uh, getting off to a great start. Um, and my focus is predominantly on the Australian New Zealand market, partnering with our biggest retailers and helping them sort of transform the way that they sell online uh, and obviously partnering with carriers to do that. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. And Jethro, that sums up where you fit into all of this. Do you like to introduce yourself and your role? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I could be quite as succinct as Rob. That was a phenomenal elevator pitch to start. Um, I'm Jethro. I'm the um, co-founder and CEO of the Nile Group. We are... Uh, a online retail business celebrating our 21st anniversary this year. So come uh, April, we I guess we come of age, and I would encourage everybody to go to thenile.com.au and sign up. I believe we're going to have quite the uh, spectacle of, of discounting and promotions going on through April. Uh, we are Australian-based global global provider. We ship to about 100, 100 odd countries per year. Uh, we sell a variety of millions of different products, including books, baby products, toys, homewares, kitchenwares. Uh, we have a variety of our own websites um, that target the various different audiences, and we sell across a whole bunch of different marketplaces, both in Australia and offshore. Uh, we are happy shipper customers and uh, very happy to be here with you and with Rob, and let's see how we go. Fantastic. It seems like everyone's really well equipped to discuss today's topic, so let's kick off. Few topics have dominated conversations from water cooler chats to the top tables of government more than economic pressures. I mean, as we speak, the RBA is meeting to discuss rates. In no industry is it easier to see how these economic pressures are playing out for consumers than retail. So Rob, I know you coined the term the retail wreck. Could you explain what that is and the current mood within the industry? Yeah, so just uh, continuing on the topic of doom and gloom, um, I coined the term retail wreck probably about nine months ago, uh, just on the back of, I guess, the tech wreck. So everyone's very familiar with the tech wreck. We sort of came into COVID with a strong market. COVID drove a proliferation and explosion of digital services, low inflation, low interest rates meant the capital markets were frothy and happy to feed the hungry mouths of a lot of tech businesses. and you know, what we saw was valuation soaring, cap raises, you know, soaring. But then when we returned to our pre-pandemic habit, habits, you know, the momentum slowed and, you know, the bubble didn't quite burst, but at least the air started seeping well and truly out of the bubble. Um, interest rates, you know, we just talked about, you know, being where they are and the cost of living pressure starting to, to kind of set in. And then obviously layoffs, which started, you know, call it 18 months ago and are still a consistent and pervasive theme across the tech industry. Similarly in retail, I guess we also saw the transformation of retail through the pandemic, uh, where we had online retail penetration rates in the Australian market of non-food retail at sub 10%. At the height of the pandemic, we saw that shoot up to 23, 24%. And that's the point where we started to see carrier networks start to melt and a lot of things start to break. Um, 
now coming out of a post-pandemic world, we've seen um, you know, a normalization or what they call a return to the curve. So that pre-pandemic sort of uh, linear growth of online retailing has remained. And we're sitting around the 16% penetration mark for total on retail and non-food categories. I guess with that, you know, we saw a lot of retailers start chasing the online dollars uh, through the pandemic and doing that in a lot of unsustainable ways. Um, so I think a lot of retailers kind of through the pandemic didn't want to let go of any opportunity for business. So, you know, it would be buying, uh, you know, different types of software to enable them to go after things, opening up operations in different areas that they hadn't thought about before and supporting um, you know, a, a lot of you know, products being shipped from locations which wouldn't have otherwise made sense. You know, one of the examples that I talk to here is fishing rods being shipped to Cooper PD from Sydney um, just to make a sale for one of our retailers and kayaks and home gym equipment as another example. Um, with all of that, what happened was a massive amount of cost went into businesses. Uh, and that drove up the operating costs and the structures of these organizations within the retail market. Then post pandemic, as the demand started to slow and the inflation started to kick in, the high interest rate sort of um, climate starts to kick in and consumer confidence takes a hit. We find ourselves in an era where the cost of doing business has become inordinately high for retail. Uh, and so with that comes a level of consolidation. Um, you know, we've also seen, according to, uh, you know, government statistics, the highest rate uh, on record of retail and logistics business failures uh, over the last 15 years. So the economic struggles are real. A lot of retailers are kind of reflecting on this and looking at their cost bases as a result and will continue to do so. Uh, and it doesn't help that we've got some foreign entrants in the market uh, by way of Amazon and Timu really starting to go after, uh, you know, the, the, the dollars from, from shoppers. So the fight for retail is real and every dollar absolutely counts. Well, Jeffrey, I can't see you right now, but I can imagine you and everyone viewing have been nodding along with this. Does any of that resonate particularly strongly for the Nile? What's your interpretation of the mood amongst your peers from that retail perspective? I think absolutely everything Rob said there is very, is absolutely bang on correct. Um, you know, if I can double down on some of the points and also just elaborate. So I think, you know, we went into COVID and for those two years as an online retailer, you know, it was hugely beneficial. Although we had a lot of operational problems, the fact of the matter was that there was a huge amount of compression of spend into the retail sector and then online got a disproportionate share of that. So for two years, uh, we did exceedingly well, which was, was beneficial. But with that came a lot of bad bad habits. I think that the, you know, at the time, the, the market was basically saying uh, revenue is king and revenue is what's important to so go after that. So a lot of retail businesses, ourselves included, chase that whilst not following the sort of normal disciplined approach that we would have in prior years, um, all of which came to a kind of a grinding halt in early 22 when, you know, I think I think February 22 is when we first saw it and all of a sudden, uh, you know, all that spend that had been going into online suddenly shifted into all the things that people had uh, been missing out on. And, you know, we, we saw People going back into malls, people were back into stores, people started spending on hospitality, but it was a huge beneficiary. Travel was a massive, massive beneficiary. And um, and then I think sort of during the, the period of that followed, we had to all sort of get real about the fact that the you know the growth wasn't necessarily going to come, uh, wasn't going to come back at, at the same rate. Uh, as Rob said, you know, everything had reverted back to the sort of the norm. And I think that took a while to sort of adjust to. And I think across the board, you know, we saw um, a lot of companies hang on to people and, and costs and structure and the hope and the belief that that would sort of come right. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it didn't. And we were in, what I guess you could consider the a normal or the new normal or define it what you want. Uh, and so we sort of spent the next 12 months kind of right sizing and, and getting ourselves back into fighting shape and sort of installing a lot more of the discipline uh, around customer acquisition and around operational costs. And uh, Rob, we have equally, uh, you know, we've, we've had some equally interesting um, shipping examples. I saw surfboards going off to rural um, Western Australia, regional Western Australia, and uh, things that just didn't make sense. And so we had to go through and, you know, really kind of clamp down. And I, I think the, the, the mood, if I can call it, I mean, I think it's basically, you know, this is the, it was a bit of a stark kind of uh, reversion back to some sort of normal or, or a, a reality check on, on the fact that things weren't going to be the way they were. And um, 
I think with that came a lot of a lot of companies that just probably weren't weren't able to kick back into shape, um, and as a consequence, they've sort of either gone out of business or have had to radically shift themselves. Um, but you know, the reality is that we're now kind of almost two years out of that, and I think that uh, you know everybody who's still standing has probably has probably found a way forward. And although it's a much tougher environment uh, that we've experienced for a number of years, um, I think that. To one of Rob's points, you know, the, the market size has grown so dramatically that although it's more competitive and there's more players in the space, and you know, but there's a number more people that are kind of buying this along. And, and you know, there were a lot of customers that weren't online buyers pre-2020 or now absolutely sort of very fundamental online buyers as a part of their, their spending habits. Hmm. We're definitely picking up on that mood. Uh, Ship It works with over 4,000 retailers and they facilitate hundreds of millions of deliveries annually. So you obviously have a lot of data, Rob. Uh, what are you seeing in these numbers, particularly relating to these consumer spending and habits? Yeah, I mean, you know, with great uh, great power comes great responsibility, right? So I think, you know, what what I can say is, you know, look looking at the data, and we kind of see ourselves as an index of of commerce, really. So I don't call it e-commerce anymore because I think we're in this new era. You know, Paul Greenberg always talks about, you know, digital being the new era, but really, you know, the lines have been completely blurred. But so as we kind of look at our data. You know, despite you know a lot of the rhetoric around cost of living pressures in 2023, um, what remained was I guess consistent order volume, uh, you know, through the retailers that we work with, um, and it wasn't a massive curtailment of demand, but what people were buying actually changed quite a bit, and when they bought changed quite a bit. Um, we saw a lot of retailers to try and you know as Jethro kind of talked to, you know, cut out unsustainable practices, start to reduce their frequency and depth of promotions and discounts and offers and look for new ways to try and drive, um, you know, repeat purchase amongst their customer base. Um, but what we actually saw was there was a lot of pent up demand that was released as shoppers took advantage of sales events like Click Frenzy, which went, you know, a month earlier uh, than it did last year. Black Friday coming in with a really strong peak season this year. Um, you know, and what we saw was a peak season that was stronger than the year prior. So there is some merit in, you know, the the, the sensitivity for shoppers and, and kind of looking for a bargain. Uh, what we actually saw, if you kind of break that down further, is whilst order volume was there or thereabouts flat, we did see uh, a lot of shoppers actually buying less per order and actually focusing on items that were lower value versus what they had done a couple of years prior. There's a whole bunch of reasons why that happened. You think about the, the kind of related demand for, you know, furniture and, and kind of home improvements. Everyone had kind of bought their coffee machines, their nice new sofa, uh, armoires, whatever you want to call them. Um, I guess so we saw, you know, this shift from big ticket items to, I guess, more necessity based items that came in at a bargain. So retailers that are the beneficiaries of these are value focused, like the Nile, uh, like Kmart, like Amazon, like Target, like Big W, et cetera, who offer up more affordable options and choice to customers. Um, and we we actually have seen that they've benefited more over the upmarket retailers who have more of a niche audience. Um, so I guess the key things coming about data are people are choosing where they buy from with much more uh, analytical rigor. They're looking for retailers that are going to give them value. They're a lot smarter about, you know, what they're paying fully loaded in terms of shipping cost and the cost of their order. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, people are a lot more comfortable buying online. They just need a bit of a trigger to do that. Hmm. And Jethro, how are these economic pressures playing a role in your business? So you covered it a bit before, but from that consumer confidence, that spending standpoint, has there been much change? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways to answer the question. I think the first is um, on the cost side, you know, we're, we've had to deal with all the inflationary pressure that's come through and that's affected every part of the business. I mean, logistics is one of the huge areas where, you know, we're just seeing consistent rises across the board from all the carriers. And I don't think there's any gouging going on. I just think it's the nature of the beast. Their costs are going up, our costs go up as well. And um, being able to I guess pass on what you have to the consumers without without sort of affecting the overall value proposition that Rob spoke to. 
um, is really important. And I think with that, you know, we have to start being a lot smarter about the way that we ship, uh, the way that we operate, just operationally in, in general. I think the biggest lesson over the last 12 to 24 months has just been around getting the basics right, making sure that there, are, there is no leakage. You know, we all operate in fairly tight um, margin environments. And I think the, the, you know, just making sure that every possible detail is attended to, you know, retail is detail and just making really sure that there is, there is no leakage and that there aren't these bulky items being shipped to parts of the country that you're not aware of or you're not capturing the cost of um, adequately. And so either, you know, either being able to pass that on or just discontinuing those, those lines where it doesn't make sense to continue. I think on the other side, from, from the change in retail uh, consumer behavior, like I mean, to Rob's point, the, the peak season is, is very interesting. Like it is definitely shifting. It's growing every year. Um, that Black Friday, cyber, what we, we dub Cyber Week, which is basically from the Friday right through to about the Wednesday, Thursday, which has been our experience, um, has been growing as a, a year after year after year without cessation. And what I think is happening is it sucks the air, the air completely out of December. Uh, so we're seeing December uh, ending a lot sooner. Um, and then what, it, what was interesting this year was how many retailers went to market with propositions right at the start of November um, with their Black Friday promos. And I think, you know, I think that is something we're going to see more and more of. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me going forward if um, a vast majority, sorry, I wouldn't say a vast majority, a, a larger majority of our overall trade takes place in the November month, you know, compared to all other months, compared to, compared to any other period. I just think that if consumers start to respond to those deals earlier, and keep going right through to the start of December, I think that will become, it's always been the key trading period, but I think as an overall percentage, that's just gonna increase. And I think that it's then necessary to try and gear our businesses towards that, you know, that new kind of, what's well, not a new development, but that development that's kind of accelerating. Hmm. I think that uh, question about unit economics you started with, the simple cost of doing business, you know, increasing, carriers are hiking their prices. The cost to store and send freight is very clearly on the rise. I was wondering if you could talk to that, Rob. Yeah, look, J Jethro already started with that, talking about the rate hikes across the board. I can unpack that a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but I guess you know, let's take a step back. Generally, we're gonna think about the current economic climate and how pervasive it is. It's really hard to, to unwind where we're at. So. You know, a lot of econ economists and industry leaders that, you know, are in our sort of purview are saying that the current conditions are going to persist well into 2025. Uh, so for retailers, that means the dollars they're investing in growth, you know, they really need to be very choiceful about where they place their bets in this depressed macro environment. Um, you know, it creates great businesses, right? But the, the converse of that is we've got to deal with some of these stubborn stubborn inflationary sort of items. And if you think about it, top three costs for any online retailer are pretty simply put, cost of goods, staff, and freight. And if you think about COGS, where that sort of rocketed to through, you know, the inflationary pressures of, you know, container shipping costs, you know, staffing and, and all those sorts of things, um, you know, what we've seen is labor cost and shipping costs are the one constant that has continued to rocket for businesses. So a lot of the carriers that we've seen on our platform um, have, you know, pretty much passed on cost increases of seven to nine percent. And as Jethro kind of pointed out, that really stems from two things. One is cost of fuel and the cost of labor and the shortage of labor in the service industry. Um, so this is just passing on what is the normal cost of doing business and the need to actually be a profitable company and an ongoing concern so that they don't, you know, fall into that failure statistic that I talked about earlier. Um, what we're seeing more of, and this is probably part of the reason why smart retailers like Jethro at the Nile have focused on not sending kayaks or surfboards out to rural Western Australia is, you know, we're seeing more surcharges and penalties being imposed by carriers as they seek out cost recovery. What I mean by that is certain carriers have appreciated that certain items cost more for them to move within their network, so they actively price themselves out of particular routes or freight types. Now that's a really important point because that changes all the time. Um, and so in order to be really well informed about, well, what products should I be imposing a customer pays, you know, fully passed on shipping cost versus which items should I absorb into my free shipping offer? Um, these hidden costs are the ones that are really coming out in the wash. And as retailers are doing a bit of reconciliation as to what they think they spent on freight versus what they actually spent, this is where there's a lot of hidden cost.
because um, it could double, if not triple, the cost of shipping orders for retailers. We've seen examples where shipping costs for one item have blown out to $1,000 uh, without a retailer really knowing that, uh, just based on the nature of the goods that were being shipped. Um, so the key thing here is really getting clear on the data and really you know, trying to avoid being slugged with these types of penalties and being a lot smarter about the freight networks you're using to ship your goods. Mm. Well, with these hidden costs and these conditions, you know, expected to continue for the near future, Jeffrey, I was wondering what processes or strategies you're putting in place approaching 2024 and beyond, especially around freight. Yeah, I think building on what Rob said and what I was also saying earlier, I think a lot of this is just around really clear understanding of what your data says, you know, um, in I guess one of the one of the major ones with regards to freight is I expect my charge to be X. You know, we can have some process at the end of the month where you go, you know, was X actually what I ended up paying? It seems like a very simple no brainer, but the problem is, you know, you're dealing with a hell of a lot of complexity in, in these businesses where freight is just one component. And very often, you know, with the cost of labor, where it is, you haven't got an abundance of people to just do everything. So these are one of the things that can often get overlooked. Um, but I think for any retailer out there, this is one of those areas where just have building in some kind of a, a regular reconciliation where you just make sure that your expectations are are being met by reality and that you're not missing any particular um, surcharge or you're not missing any particular, you know, you're, you're expecting a dead weight rate and you're ending up with a volumetric rate, whatever they might be, and just make sure that you are capturing all aspects of the costs that are coming through um, and, and passing those on, or at least be cognizant of the fact that these costs exist and that you need to deal with them in some way, shape or form. They're not going to just disappear or by ignoring them. Um, so I think that that's a relatively simple thing that a retailer can do um, on a monthly basis, but I think will absolutely pay dividends um, you know, over, over a period of time uh, if you just make sure that you're, um, you're clear on that. I think in general, you know, um, cost of labor is a huge one. So any, anything that you can do around automation is always, is always beneficial. And I think that's that's more and more the case now. So whether that's um, you know improving processes within your warehousing uh, to ensure that there are less touch points within the warehouse, uh, that there are uh, automation um, aspects of it, so that you are having less people do the work that needs to be done, or you know have some degree of um, automation where it comes to sortation, packing, conveyor, whatever the component is within the warehouse that allows you uh, to basically squeeze more efficiency out of that operation than you would have in the past. I think those kind of investments make a ton of sense at the moment. They're probably making more and more sense every day. Um, and so that's definitely something to look at. And then I think just generally in your operation, looking at any kind of um, aspect of it where you can minimize the amount of effort going in to try and produce the outcome uh, is, is generally going to be beneficial. So, you know, thinking about your entire platform end to end from your marketing and your, your cost of acquisition right through to the end. And I think, you know, as far as marketing is concerned, probably one aspect to actually think about there is be very honest with yourself around what those lifetime values or the actual value of those customers are that you're acquiring. Because I think there's often a, a, a sense that you can just kind of spend and hope that, you know, the people will re you'll retain that customer over a period of time. And very often that's not the case. And I think that really need, sort of deserves um, you know, a thorough round of kind of investigation to make sure that you are actually getting the outcomes that you expect that, that you would be getting. Well, that actually brings me perfectly to my next question for Rob. I was wondering what role Ship It actually plays in helping retailers navigate that climate and achieve that. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, Jethro's you know, given some really good sort of insight into, you know, the, 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 the entire customer journey and looking at ways to automate and optimise. I guess at our at our heart, you know, at its at its pure core, what Chipper does is really, you know, to help automate decision making in a way that protects the bottom line of business. Um, so if you think about it, you know, there is a lot of optionality now available to retailers in terms of different networks. Um, there's a lot of capacity that has been introduced into carry networks. So on the back of a lot of these COVID in, inflated volumes, a lot of carriers got their proverbial shit together in terms of automation in facilities, you know, new routes, you know, driver capacities, et cetera. And they've got real well-oiled machinery sort of now working around. So the job of Shipit is to help retailers take advantage of that infrastructure. 
Uh, we've introduced new services through our smart routing proposition, which allows retailers to select between the best carrier for individual legs of deliveries to make that a lot more efficient and a better experience. But naturally, we're a software platform. And our job as a software platform is to automate the, 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 the kind of drudgery of the arse end of commerce. So if we think about it, it's sweating the current assets that a retailer has uh, through optimizing decisions and choices based on cost or quality or whatever it is a retailer wants to optimize for. Um, but a few examples are, you know, helping retailers leverage stores for endless aisle and, and selling inventory that was otherwise not available for online sale. That's been a massive boon for retailers looking to get return if they've got a physical infrastructure that's not being leveraged for online. Um, optimizing decisions around which carrier to use for which types of goods to which areas based on cost or even live quoting costs where you know a customer should be paying for their shipping. Um, and then finally, you know, we're also partnering with a lot of retailers who are starting to put on their own fleets. Um, so some retailers have found they have enough density in a local geography to actually put in their own drivers and their own vans. Uh, and we're giving them technology which helps them optimize their routes, give a better customer experience and the like. Um, so all in all, you know, and I guess the flip side of all of this is helping carriers actually, you know, earn more profitable business and carry the right compatible goods for their networks to make the whole process more efficient and to reduce waste. Um, all of it relies on a lot of data and a lot of smarts, and that's the job of Ship It. Fantastic. Thanks, Rob and Jeffrey. That actually brings us to the end of my questions for today. We did have some Q&A space at the end here, but I think we've ran out of time. If you do have any questions for Rob, Jeffro, or I, just email them through. We will send the recording of this um, after the session. So feel free to reply with some questions and I'll pass them on. I'd like to again thank our panelists for some fantastic insights today. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Thanks so much. Great to talk. Well, join me next week on February 13th for episode two in the series where I'll be discussing the retail revolution, Amazon's delivery revolution versus Timu's price disruption. That'll be with James Yunez, the head of sales at ShipIt. Hopefully see you all next week with our cameras on. <laughs> Thanks, guys.